Good evening and welcome to another episode of Unscripted and Unchained RPG Review. I am DM Bloodworth and as you can see by the graphics, uh, tonight's video is a, uh, is a recap of uh, sessions 3 and 4 of season 2 of our AD&D first edition Greyhawk campaign. So uh, if you've been following along, uh, you'll actually know that this is, this is weeks 18 and 19 of my current campaign. So uh, the campaign, uh, and, and that's including the week and a half to two weeks of, um, of session zero. So really we're, you know, we have just concluded 17 weeks of game sessions. So really, really excited about that. And uh, before I actually go into the recap, I, I wanted to talk a little bit about my group. I always like to talk about my group and um, really a, a great group of people. And we started having a discussion because we're, we are coming into the holiday, um, we are coming into the holiday weeks. Um, my own family celebrated ho um, the holiday season uh, on Saturday. And we will, of course, celebrate it with my wife's side of the family uh, on um, you know Christmas, uh, Christmas Eve and Christmas Day and such. So, um, and, and everybody is kind of in the same situation. We're just getting prepared for it. Uh, we have one member who is in the process of moving and we hope to have him back by next week. We had another, uh, another member who's been on vacation for two weeks. So, uh, with a lot of moving parts and everything, we have nine players plus myself, uh, last week, uh, I was uh, I was indisposed on Monday, you know, really not feeling well, and so we had a Tuesday night game uh, instead. So we have some flexibility uh, with uh, with our schedules, and uh, with nine players, there's also flexibility as to what we can ac actually accomplish if a player or two or even three can't show up. As long as we have the nice uh, balance of uh, player characters and and ability, uh, and and they really work well together, that uh, we could still run something. I could still put something together for them to do little mini side quests or uh, just informational gathering types of adventures and such. So it doesn't always have to be combat, uh, and that that's something that's important for. You know, uh, you to realize, you know, or, or utilize if you're a, a new GM uh, or a new dungeon master that, um, you know, you don't always have to make it a combat oriented uh, session. You, you know, we've, we've had a couple of sessions now where there was no combat whatsoever. It was all dealing with, uh, you know, introductions to new NPCs and uh, discovering new locations and learning about uh, the game world, you know, as it's as it's developing along its timeline, quasi-independent of the player's actions, um, you know, and, and then that's one thing that I like to, uh, that I'd like to express here about what a campaign is. And uh, a campaign is, I think the best way to describe it is, it's a, it's a setting with a, an ongoing timeline in which the player characters are uh, adventuring in. And so player character actions uh, play a role in, uh, in modifying that, that timeline uh, in certain circumstances. And that's both positive and negative role that they can play in that timeline. And if they have a neutral role, in other words, they choose not to do certain things, well, that timeline is still moving forward. The world is still existing. It's still, you know, um, evolving as, as that time goes by. And that could be either for good or for bad as far as the player characters are going to be concerned. So it's, it's very much a living world that, um, that I'm trying to create. And I think that if you 
kind of do the same thing. I mean, you're obviously going to have your own twist on things. Um, you're going to have your own way of running a game. But I, I think it's really important for you to build that sense of a living world for your player characters and, and for your players to really experience. And their buy-in is going to be tremendous if, uh, if you can pull it off. Now, I, I, I might just be very fortunate. You know, I, I think I've made some good decisions about how I'm running this particular campaign. And I'm really fortunate to have the players that I have. But one, one thing that they really expressed to me last night, because it was some question as to, you know, we had four players who weren't able to make last night. And, and it was really up in the air for that first half hour or so uh, when we only had two, you know, two players. And then suddenly we had three and, and so for that first half an hour to 40 minutes, we were sitting there wondering, well, maybe we'll just put it off until tonight, Tuesday, uh, rather, than, rather than having a Monday night. And my, a couple of my players came out and they said straight out, the thing that they really like about this campaign is that we've been so consistent. Uh, we, we have five or more players who have been here for all 17 sessions, uh, game sessions, plus the, you know, the zero sessions. Uh, and, and some of them actually went to both zero sessions, even though they accomplished what they needed to during the first, just to see, you know, how it was going with the other players as well. So, um, but they, they really bought into this campaign because of the consistency um, that we've been able to maintain number one and number two that that core group of uh, of players has has really started to to gel and you know and and I will show a chart you know that one of the players like he he threw it to this thing together and it's just phenomenal I'm, I'm so um, so fortunate that he put this together uh, for us. So, without further ado, let's get into sessions three and four. So, session three, as I said, about about seven of the players were were available for session three, uh, and I'll, I'll check the chart to make sure I have that straight. And they. They started to inspect the area uh, around the mound with the totem uh, that was on it. But uh, if you recall from that session, virtually every single member of the party was injured at some point during that combat. And so they, they decided uh, that they were going to head on back to Westburn to heal up level up because several more players now are ready to to cross that threshold over into level four and um and so they just wanted to spend the time uh taking care of that aspect of their uh of their development their their growth and they, and they wanted to kind of contemplate and figure out what their next step is because uh going into that session they essentially had five options that they could have gone in and going into that session i didn't know which options they were actually going to or what ultimately which option they were going to take so they could have traveled back to Quescatan where they wanted to secure their um their their quasi stronghold uh they technically have the deed for it but um but other than when they first cleared it out, they haven't done anything as far as securing it. So when they return to Quescaton, um, they're not quite sure what they're going to find. They're hoping that um, the reputation of the place and the fact that a, a powerful group of adventurers just went through there and, and basically cleared house, you know, through there, that hopefully it will take some time before any... Uh, 
you know, any um, not so wary inhabitants of the wilderness make their way into uh, the stronghold in their in the player character's absence. Um, again, timelines continue to advance. So when they're when they're doing things, there's an impact. When they don't do things, there's an impact. And uh, if they do positive things, they'll they'll see evidence of their positive impact. And when they make mistakes and there's, you know, potentially negative consequences, they will see that as well. So that was one of their choices. The second choice that they had was to uh, go back to Westburn and to heal and level up. Their third choice was to push forward towards uh, the Caves of Chaos, which they, they kind of loosely are aware that the Caves of Chaos played some kind of a role amongst the troglodytes and the dark druids that they encountered in Quescaton. So they, they knew that they wanted to eventually go to the Caves of Chaos and see what was going on there. They also had, um, they also had read in a journal that they found in Quescaton that, um, that the fighter lord Rogan had traveled to the Caves of Chaos pursuing some information at the, uh, at the request of the Archmage Keligar. Um, and, and they're still not sure what role these two, um, you know, very, very prestigious and heroic figures uh, actually played in all that's going on uh, with Quescaton now, anywhere from 20 to 30 years removed from the last sighting of those two individuals. So they're still trying to tie some of these loose ends together. They could have delved deeper into the swampland, which they've now just, you know, got to the mound, and they could have gone uh, deeper into the, uh, the swamplands. And then they also had the, um, the storyline, which was player-created, um, our, our druid Sparrow, played by Leah, she really took an interest in this wereboar uh, hide that was found. And they just, she, in this, this session here, um, actually the most recent session, um, so last night's session, she actually put it together. She was like, well, wait a second. If you kill a were creature, it reverts back to its normal form. All right, so it should have been a human skin that they saw and not a the hide of a werebear, you know, with its fur and all of that. So they're starting to realize that there there is something very, um, very odd going on with uh, lycanthropes related to, you know, these dark druids, which, which is another very odd thing that you would have druids that are kind of toting that line between um, pure neutrality and potentially evil. And, and so they're still trying to get to know what's going on there. So in last night, uh, last week's session, they made that decision. We're going to go back to Westburn. Um, they were short two players. And so they were going to go back to Westburn and train up becoming level four on their way there so they they have about a four four and a half day journey and on their way there once they got to the road way they they were kind of skirting along these um some higher ground some hills and and you know very craggy shale type uh outcroppings that um you know, or just jagged stone, uh, whether it's shale or not. I'm, I'm not quite sure. I'm not a geologist. But they, they, they were skirting around some of this kind of rougher terrain, wild country. And uh, while they were camping at night, in the seventh hour, uh, so some of them actually had their full six hours of sleep before their encounter occurred. And, and when their encounter occurred, uh, it was the ranger who happened to be on watch, Angus, and he was the first one that kind of picked up. He heard the sound of um, large lumbering bodies coming on down um, down the rocky, uh, craggy hills um, near them. 
and then uh, there's elves in the party, and so um, I, I forget if it was Breeze or uh, perhaps it was um, uh, perhaps it was the other. Um, oh, I just drew a blank. Uh, perhaps it was the the other elf as well that might have spotted them and could see that um, these were large these were large figures that uh, have um, about seven and a half feet tall and uh, with just one central eye uh, in their heads and they could tell even with their their infravision because you know an eye is going to let out different uh, heat signature than the rest of the body so they could clearly see um, basic features of this face and they, they, they were like oh my gosh it's it's you know, we're being attacked by six Cyclops. Um, they were actually Cyclop, Cy, uh, Cyclops kins uh, from the Monster Manual too. And so, uh, so they encountered these, uh, you know, so these creatures who were attacking them. And, uh, you know, clearly these creatures uh, did not, uh, you know, did not anticipate the power of this party even though this party was was smaller than it usually is uh still very easily handled uh the party and uh well the party very easily handled them um you know dealing out some damage and in some cases they did take they did take some damage during this combat and um you know it, it was really just a a very quick thing uh, only lasted a couple of rounds looking at it. it looks like the the whole of the combat lasted about four maybe four rounds and um, you know and and the party went and they discovered a, a, a small cave that these uh, that these creatures I mean relatively small cave that these uh, creatures were were living in and they kind of dug through their their belongings and their trash and stuff found some pieces of like broken caravan uh wagons and uh some human remains and and you know, overall uh, a few thousand uh copper pieces uh scattered here and there throughout the uh throughout the space so once again they're they're still facing that that ever you know ever present dilemma of their very experience rich and they're not picking up too much coins so they're 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 always thinking about ways in which they can um ways in which they can make some extra money in order to pay for their leveling up uh and their training that's associated with that but uh, luckily for them their their ratings from you know that session uh was was as good as it could be so it was going to be a straight up 240 gold pieces to train up for the week and so it was um it was just a one session calculation so they were they were kind of benefited from the fact that uh it was a very abbreviated session so that was the end of last week now we come into last night and again as i mentioned at the very beginning um now there was only five players who were able to make last night and so once again we started pursuing uh some of the side quests that um that had developed over the last uh last almost like month and a half now and what they decided that they would do was travel to the capital city of loftwick and uh approach the um approach the temple of bokab all right and uh they wanted to speak to a, a clerical uh a clerical um a faction or or you know order uh to the deity bokab because there was so much about magic taking place in their campaign so far that they felt that they would get the most information from there they also wanted to uh, come into contact with, uh, at the very least, representatives of the Grand Druid of this region, which they expected they, that they would find 
representatives, uh, most likely amongst the clerics of Obad High in Loftwick as well. And so they were kind of per pursuing uh, two different lines of inquiry. One about lycanthropes and, and magic alterations and, and some of that going on. And then the other was about the dark druids and the, you know, and the just the oddities associated with that as well. Now, again, the 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 players are very experienced, and and this is also something that you have to consider uh, as a dungeon master when you're playing with very experienced players. They're going to have some knowledge that their characters may or may not have. Now, with such a large group, uh, I have the benefit of being able to explain some of the knowledge that the players have. All right, so if the if the ranger says, um, who's played by, um, you know, who's Angus and is 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 played by. Um, by oh my gosh, I am so fried tonight. I'm sorry, um, Kelly Foot. Sorry, so it's played by Kelly, and Kelly may know something about the game, um, being a former TSR uh, employee writer um, back in the early '80s, and and you know he does know about the game, um, probably far more expertise than even I have. And so he has some information, but I tell him, I says, well, if you talk to the Druid, then you'll know about that, you know? And then I turn to, I turn to Leo, who's playing the Druid, and I'll say, because you're a Druid, you would know this information. And now you can talk to Angus, the Ranger, who has some questions. All right, and then they start to, and, and that's how you can kind of integrate player knowledge into character knowledge by, by just saying, because you, you can't wipe out the player's knowledge. The player's going to always know it. So you, you have to try to explain it and get them to express it through what their characters would know. And when when the players don't know the information but the character should that's when i come in and i'll say well because you're a fighter and you know about training in this particular fashion then you know this all right if it's something reasonable that a fighter would know even if the player doesn't and and so that's you kind of have to play that balance out uh, between player knowledge and character knowledge and make sure that it spreads across, um, you know, evenly without giving them too much information that they wouldn't normally have. So they decided to head to the main city and there they started to gain some information. So what I did was I, I determined... Well, how many bits of information are they actually going to get? And uh, that was done with some secret roles, and it turned out that the you know the first the first uh, you know series of questions that they were going to ask, and and this was the this was the ranger who is now actually, um, and, and that was another thing I didn't bring up. The ranger decided that. Um, Actually, I should say the player of the ranger decided that uh, he wanted to actually play a bard. Uh, that was really his. This was his first time playing a ranger, and he wasn't wasn't too happy with it. Um, you know, and and the ranger being the most powerful of their combatants, uh, but he still it just wasn't happy with it. He was like, you know, he he typically played bards, and he'd really like to play a bard. Now, there's a very easy way. For a ranger to do that, and that's just to kind of defrock himself, and he's no longer a ranger. Now he's a fighter, you know. So it's a fairly easy transition for um, for a ranger or a paladin if they 
secretly desire, you know, listen, I'd rather be a fighter now. And, and so he's going to pursue that. Um, so at this point now, Angus is a, is a fighter, or, you know, a regular fighter, not a ranger any longer. You know, it's going to take me a little bit to get used to that. But, um, but he decided to go along with uh, Amalric, the, uh, the elf, that, that was the elf that I forgot earlier, uh, to go with Amalric to go talk to the, um, to go talk to the magic users. And the information that they gathered was that, um, was that, oh, I got the wrong, the wrong sheet here. So the information that they gathered was that um, they learned a little bit more about Kelligar and they learned that um, that Kelligar was was the apprentice of Kalb, which they already knew, and that Kalb was an apprentice at, at one point of Zajig. And so now they kind of have that connection of, well, now they can see some of the, the madness flowing through from, you know, especially with Kelligar, which they always kind of wondered, you know, he always seemed to be kind of off in some of the things that he was doing. They learned a little bit about lycanthropes and and how, yes, it is, in fact, a, a very odd thing of, um, you know, that that the halfling was, was a werefrog and that... Um, you know, it was just outside of what the curse normally does. And so there's certainly an interest in there in discovering a little bit about that. They they asked about the demon temple that they saw in Quescaton, and they got no response to that. So there was no answer to that. They spoke about the 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 frog totem that they had encountered and even though they even though they, they they asked the right questions and they seemed to get a response, but they also picked up uh, a sense that the um, the cleric of Bokab was holding back information. Um, so they'll they'll take that with, you know wherever they can go with it. Um, they asked questions about deities that would have a very uh, bigoted point of view because that's what they encountered with the dark druid um, Avante and they got the answer in Waystry. Now Waystry has a connection to Zajig which they're starting to piece that together as well and they're, they're they're slowly piecing this together. They don't know quite where the Dark Druids play into this. However, they learned more from the Druid, um, the priest of Obal Kahai. And so I'll switch over to that. So they gleaned some information from, from this cleric. And the information that they got was uh, they learned who the they learned who the Grand Druid of the region is, Aridia Oshkan, uh, Osk, I'm sorry, Oskholm. Um, they asked the Druid with the Cleric of Obadhai if, um, if there's been a recent challenge to the Grand Dru Druid's, um, you know, to her um, reign over the... Um, over the regional sect, uh, in in which case they they were told no, um, that uh, there there wasn't uh, there wasn't any challenge, at least an overt challenge that they were aware of. They asked about um, the halfling and 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 lycanthropes, and they knew nothing at all about it, uh, nothing that would would give them any information. Um, they asked about the skin of the werebear, and yes, that was confirmed that if you normally kill a were creature, it reverts back to its normal, uh, its normal shape. And so this was an oddity. They 
they started following some questions about the, the dark druids. And they did discover that there was a, a fairly high-level druid um, who, was, uh, who was ejected from the, from the enclave. He was kicked out. And uh, he was kicked out because um, they had discovered that he started to follow the path of, uh, of a, a priest of uh, Waystry. And so he was thrown out because he, you know, he stopped following the, the line of Druid and became a cleric instead. And, um, and, and this is where now the group that was with the Druid, uh, with, with Sparrow, they learned about Waystry and a possible connection to the Dark Druids. The, the former Ranger Angus and his group talking to um, to the clerics of uh, of Bokab also got this connection of Waystry and Zajig and, and everything. So when they came together and they started to talk to each other about, well, you know, what did you learn? What did you learn? How does this start to piece together? That's when they picked up, uh, aha, there's, there's something, you know, uh, there's something involving um, these these deities and these you know hero deities and everything and they started to realize that their adventure uh, or their campaign or, or just what they're involved with currently is uh, is kind of a big deal all right and and they're starting to understand the you know the potential, um, depth and scope of of what um, what their endeavor is ahead of them, and they started piecing together that that level of bigotry and 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 some of the actions that are taking place um, uh, with the dark druids and everything, and their fear is. Is that uh, this this might be some kind of an effort either to um, overthrow the current Grand Druid of the uh, of the region, or uh, potentially even worse, is to completely eradicate um, the demi-human population of uh, Yomenri, and and obviously that would be something that's. Uh, you know that they certainly want to work against so they are now um so now they approached uh reapproached both the clerics of bokab who seem to be kind of disconnected and disinterested with what's going on like it, it's not really a line that they were um all that impressed to pursue and even the even the clerics of, of Obad Hai and the Druid, um, they deferred to wanting to uh, first uh, speak to the Grand Druid and, and, and to find out where, what she wants to do with this situation. And so they promised the, the party that they, would, um, that they would get back to them within several weeks uh, with an answer as to whether or not they're going to assist or if they want them to pursue any any particular action. Uh, but in the meantime, uh, they certainly said that the you know the player characters are, are you know the I should say the 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 adventure party is uh, free to do as they you know as they please down there in the south. So um, so I'm, I'm I'm glad that what's starting to develop is the sense that there is this grand story that um, that the player characters can participate in uh, with enough flexibility and side quests and such to keep things kind of um, you know non-linear and and still give them the freedom to you know to make other decisions within um within their you know each of the sessions and everything so it's it's really developing into that that timeline kind of campaign that um that I was hoping to create here you know so 
semi sandboxy with uh, you know with a lot of player choice uh, going on here a lot that's that's created by the players um, so every side quest involved here between the you know the um, the hobgoblins the um, the copper dragon skin which they haven't begun pursuing that yet and the uh, and then the the werebear skin those are all three uh, mini adventures that um, that was completely created by the players and just what they took an interest in uh, or their actions or, or inactions as they were going through it. The um, even the dark druids and and the 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 halfling connection was something that that just kind of organically happened uh, as we were going you know as we were going along. It was just something that I, I you know introduced into the um, into those sessions uh, to just change things up and make them a little bit interesting. So none of this was was originally in. B1 in search of the unknown this is all um this is all organically you know generated either by myself or by my my players input so it's going really well i i can't i can't say it enough how you know awesome uh this experience has been uh going into week 19 of a uh of a campaign uh, especially during this time frame when it's all virtual too, so it's it's not like we're in person. So this is this is by by any stretch a you know uh, a, a fairly you know longevity and vitality that Gary Gygax talks in uh, you know in his book uh, you know Master of the Game, and it's something that he kept on harping on. And it, it, it's really a lot of fun to to be experiencing that uh, firsthand uh, with a you know with a group of players. So let me show you what uh, uh, what my players have put together here. So here we have a chart, and um, I can't make it any larger than this, but you can see basically it's just the you know the keepers of Quescatan and season one. Um, I don't know if he actually broke it down into season one and season two. Yes, he did. So we our first play session was on uh, August 18th, and we moved through. Now it was these five players are are still the five original players are still with us, and then we lost uh, these four players. And then it was around session, it was in session four when we picked up some new players uh, who essentially replaced the old players almost class for class as well. So we lost a druid, we picked up a new druid. We lost a paladin, picked up a new paladin. Lost a fighter, picked up a new fighter. So it really worked out well. And then you can see going through here the consistency of some of these players they've been here for every single session <coughs> all the way through 17 sessions so um, so again I mean super super stoked uh, that uh, you know the players have been you know just really bought into the campaign and uh, it's a very diverse group as far as uh, you know, as far as their uh, their character classes and uh, even their races, although they're mostly humans, there's there's a couple. You know, there's a halfling, there's there's two elves, there's a half elf. There was a dwarf, and then we lost a dwarf. So nice mixture. Um, as you can see, most of the uh, most of the group is actually leaning towards chaotic good, um, but some neutral good. So predominantly good. A couple neutrals, and um, we have the players' time zones, uh, which is helpful when you're you're planning things. Uh, what they gained in experience and and gold pieces uh, throughout for every single session, and then what, if they miss a session, then it just recalculates. Now some of the player 
some of the player characters have a bonus, others don't. And then uh, their subtotals, their bonuses, if there's yes or no, uh, their totals, and then needed for next needed for next level. And so we can start to see it. And um, he just puts this together. Amalric just puts this together uh, each week and and just you know keeps it keeps it uh, you know organized and calculated. All I do is feed him the the general info. And then he gets back um, and and updates that. So again, I can't say it enough. What a great group of players, um, great group of friends. Because I can I consider them all friends. I mean, we we've been together for 19 weeks. You know, in most cases, even the newcomers in they came in a week four. So we've been together for 14. You know, uh, you know, 14 weeks or 15 weeks together. And, and still coming together every Monday night or sometimes Tuesday. And, uh, but every single week consistently. And they, they really want it. They, you know, they're like, we really don't want to break up this, you know, this trend that we've been doing. We've had a session every single week. And uh, I, I certainly plan on doing so moving forward as we go and uh, we'll see at what point we introduce another official adventure module which I will completely revamp um, so I mean basically we'll end up using you know good portions of the map and, and maybe some of the story and then the rest of it will be modified based on, on what the players are doing so once again Thanks for joining. I hope you liked this, uh, you know, this video. If you did, uh, please leave a uh, thumbs up. If you haven't subscribed, please consider subscribing. If you have any questions or comments, uh, please leave those in the, uh, you know, in the comments section. If you have any questions about running long campaigns or, you know, what what kind of rules uh, modifications I use for Advanced Dungeons and Dragons First Edition, then uh, you know, put those in there. If you want to question why I'm running a first edition AD&D campaign rather than um, a newer game or, or whatever, I will gladly you know, talk about that and why AD&D first edition is, is my Dungeons & Dragons edition of choice. I have no problem with doing that. I think that it is... Uh, I think that it is a, a great game system, and uh, and and I want to try to dispel the idea. I recently put up a poll question on our Discord uh, to see, you know, basically what the, you know what's the age and experience level of my group, and so uh, you know I started off. I'm 54 years old my first edition of Dungeons and Dragons that I played, and that was my introduction to role-playing games in general, was either Holmes or Moldvay. Probably Holmes, because I think we're, we, we started playing in 77 or 78. Um, so I'm thinking it was probably Holmes, but I didn't own Holmes. That was my, uh, my dungeon master, uh, Shayana's, his... It was his uh, game, and then I bought the Mold Bay, Mold Bay box set when that first came out, and that would have been around 70, uh, 79-ish, or, or maybe 78. Um, and then we went right to AD&D First Edition once that started rolling out. So by 79 and 80, we were fully immersed in Advanced Dungeons & Dragons at that point, and we played that for an additional uh, anywhere from eight to possibly nine years. I think I stopped playing in uh, in maybe eighty nine. Um, although D and D probably around eighty seven or eighty eight. So roughly another ten years dedicated to playing the game uh, back then. So once again, uh, you know, thanks for joining. And I look forward to seeing you on a gaming screen sometime soon. And uh, just be on the lookout for some more, some more videos. I am going to do another video this week uh, and uh, bring you up to date. Go over Chapter 2 
of uh, The Master of the Game by Gary Gygax and, and spend a little time breaking down that chapter. There's some really interesting things in there that I want to, uh, I want to share with some of my other fellow YouTubers out there who have some ideas that uh, I don't necessarily see eye to eye with them. And, uh, you know, I'm just really anxious to show them. L listen, this is what Gary actually said uh, about um, about that. And, and some of it might even support some of their ideas. But I think that, um, you know, it, with careful review of it, they'll see, oh, okay, maybe it is more this than what I was thinking. So looking forward to putting that video together. Probably do that on Wednesday. So again, thanks for joining. Have a great evening and uh, keep on gaming out there. All right, take care.